Good evening, and thank you for uh, joining us this evening for our live stream astronomy presentation, which is tonight is going to be Sky Cultures of the World, presented by Charles Ennis. Uh, I'm Rick Wallace with the Pareto Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and I will be the moderator for today's talk. Uh, we offer um, programming at this time um, even though we're just beginning to test uh, opening up uh, certain hours, and you can find on our website, uh, uh, peaknature.org, uh, information about which hours we're going to be open. We've just started opening this past week uh, and had quite a few visitors. We're also continuing many of our online activities that we have been doing over the last year since we had to close for, our, for the clo uh, COVID uh, epidemic. Um, so. Um, we also have a number of uh, our talks that have been given in the past year and other activities that have been recorded and are available on YouTube. And those are listed again on the peaknature.org uh, website. We're able to do this programming because of the generosity of our wonderful members and donors. So we'd like to thank you for your continued support. So let's move on to our presentation. Uh, Charles Ennis is the first Vice President of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, he got his first telescope as a child in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, this kindled a uh, passion that has taken him forward to the present day. He uh, served in the Vancouver Police Department from 1977 to 2005, then became a civilian police dispatcher uh, for emergency communications in Southwest British Columbia. He retired from law enforcement in 2013 and is an experienced public speaker and published author. He wrote the Society's books, Building a Small Observatory and the Solar Observator Observer's Handbook. Uh, and has joined the Royal Astronomical Society's Sunshine Coast Center in August of 2013 and quickly became involved in helping to build that center's small observatory, which opened to the public in June of 2015. Within months of joining the center, Ennis became their media director. Then in December of 2014, he became the center president. He currently serves as the society's first vice president, um, as well as the publications committee, um, diversity committee, finance committee, and so on, and is uh, the public speaker program administrator. He's the writer and co-host of six seasons of the Night Lights Astronomy Show on Eastlink TV the writer and host of the short Bravo documentary Starry Nights, and the director producer of the Royal Astronomical Society training film, The Stars Belong to Everyone. Charles, why don't you start up your camera and uh, go ahead and begin the presentation. Thank you very much for joining us from Canada. Uh, one advantage of having these remote um, uh, talks uh, during this time period is that we can invite people like Charles here from all over the country. So we really appreciate him uh, being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Very good to be here. My community is about the same size as uh, the community you're coming from, Seashell, British Columbia. So let's get going here. I want to talk about all the different sky cultures of the world, how the view, people of the world view the sky from different places. Now, I was at the observatory about two years ago, this is our observatory in the Sunshine Coast, and I noticed there was some people out on the deck of my president there on the left, he was looking up over the roof of the observatory at the northern sky, and he seemed very intent about it, so when I had a break in the action, I went out and said, hey Bruce, what are you looking at, and he said, that's not a bear, and obviously he's looking at Ursa Major, so I said, well, if it's not a bear, what is it, and he goes, it's a rat, I mean, look at it. It's a rat. <laughs> okay, I think maybe you're on something here. And I mean, of course, we know that thousands of years ago, it probably looked a little bit more like a bear. Why do I say that? This shows you the sky from 100,000 years before common era to 100,000 after. And you can see they move quite a bit, all of the stars. And here's a couple of other constellations, Orion and Leo, and they're really speeded up, but you get the point. All these stars are moving. This is a Korean star map, which was actually uh, made from an even older map. And, this, and we'll get back to this map later, but this doesn't match the current 
of stars in the sky. So if what you were hoping to do was to go out and see the exact sky that your very ancient ancestors saw, well, I mean, on the scale of a single lifetime, this sky seems pretty fixed. But over multiple generations, it doesn't work that way. So it, it's not going to be quite what you expected. One other thing I quickly want to throw out there, because I'm going to mention this, is what asterisms are. Okay, we just talked about Ursa Major, which is a constellation, but everybody's learned about a few bright stars that form something that's called the Big Dipper, the Plow, or the Wane, depending on what culture you come from. That's an asterism, a small group of bright stars. The reason I'm bringing it up is some cultures don't use constellations at all, they use asterisms. So if you hear me talking about asterisms, now you know what that is. All right. So we go back to Plato, down in the corner there. This was the sky he gave us. These are the 48 Ptolemaic constellations that we use to this day in modern astronomy. And this is a snapshot of his culture. You can see animals that they would have been familiar with in his day. You can see a scientific instrument. They gave us trigonometry. There's a triangle. There are mythological figures. It's all kinds of things that would be familiar to people in his day. Now. Move ahead to 1922, and Western scientists in the Northern Hemisphere decided we need constellations in the Southern Hemisphere because we're doing navigation and we're doing observing and we need to divide up the sky. Now, it obviously meant that they didn't think that any of the people in the Southern Hemisphere had any constellations. They probably figured they were uneducated savages, and we were doing them a favor by doing this. And this is a snapshot of 1920s culture. Look at it. You see a pump, and you see a compass, and a telescope, and a microscope, and a sailing ship, and all kinds of things that would have been familiar to people in Western white culture in 1920. OK. Did you know there were 7,000 world languages out there, and that you're in your children's lifetime, half of those will probably disappear? And you're probably thinking, well, okay, thank you in another language, so thank you, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is cultures are the foundations of knowledge, and the key concepts and ways of seeing the world would disappear with those languages. And this relates to the difficulty in translating words accurately into other languages. This is my favorite example. That's New Zealand, beautiful country. And the word is Fenua, which means, well, it's a Maori word from the Maori Iwi, and it means land, country, ground, terrain, and placenta. Let that sink in for a second. The land that gave me birth, the land that nourishes me. Do you see where I'm going with this? Now, if we look at the Maori culture and Maori skies, they use the night sky in a manner similar to a Polynesian, but different enough to warrant its own sky culture. Maritime themes are central to the Maori sky culture we use extensively in nautical navigation. These people were amazing navigators going across thousands of miles of open ocean back when my ancestors were afraid to leave the coastline. And along with most other cultures, the rising and setting of prominent stars we use to signal planting and harvesting seasons. So here is a Maori sky. And you can see right there, that's Orion. But not if you're Maori, the three stars and what we would call the belt of Orion are actually the glittering wires going off the back of this boat. And that triangle there, which is the Hyades cluster, which is the head of Taurus the bull of your Ptolemy, is the sail of the Tainui. And Tainui is one of the Maori iwi. And the Pleiades cluster is the phone at the front of the boat. And every single thing you see in this sky is named for something that is related to navigation. Very, very serious about this stuff. Here's the standard southern sky that we were talking about from 1922. Here's the Maori sky. There's the great boat of Tama Rareti. There's the uh, Tetara Otewaka of Tama Tureti, which is the rope of Tama Rareti's canoe, or the rope of Te Ponga. What's Te Ponga? The Taki Otahi, the southern cross, sometimes called Te Ponga, which means the anchor. And over there, Ato Hahiat's compass. So, what have we learned so far? The skies are a calendar. Many these people didn't have a calendar they could put on the wall and refer to to figure out it was time to plant. They wanted to know. They went out and they looked up. It was a divination system. It was a navigational tool. Obviously, we just saw some good examples there. 
And it was a place to honor the gods, the ancestors, and their culture. So what am I going to do here tonight? I want to give you perspectives from different places of the world. I want to show you that there was ancient science all over the place. And I want to inspire you. So here we go. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to show you two pieces of sky. I'm going to show you the winter sky. This is what it looks like from my observatory at the winter solstice. Okay. And here you have Orion. And there you have Taurus, the Hyades cluster. And there you have the Pleiades. And there's the brightest star Sirius. Okay. The other piece of sky is the summer solstice sky. There's the teapot, Sagittarius. There is a little piece of Scorpius sticking above the horizon there. You'll see that a lot. There's the brightest star, Vega, there was in Lyra. Okay, so the oldest guy that we know of is the Armitsi cave in Spain. It dates to about 12,000 or 14,500 years ago. And we know what they were depicting on there. And you can see that they've got horses and ibex and lions and bison and all kinds of things. We had no idea what they called them because we don't know what their language was back then. But the people who discovered this and studied this are reasonably sure this is a piece of the Milky Way you're looking at here. And I've highlighted the teapot there so you can see basically what we're, what part of the sky we're looking at. So what I want to do now is look at the Egyptian sky, okay? The ancient Egyptian sky. And what they, they had is something called Bakiu, 36 groups of stars or asterisms rising consecutively on the horizon throughout each Earth rotation. The rising of each Baku, Dekan, marked the beginning of a new hour, or Dekanal, of the night. And they were used as a sidereal star clock beginning by at least 9th or 10th dynasty. That's about 2100 BCE. And because a new decant also appears every 10 days in the eastern sky at dawn, right before the sun rises, the ancient Greeks called them Dekanoi, which means 10. Now, the Egyptian sky um, is very definitely connected to not just astronomy, but, but astrology, and it is related to Greco-Roman culture because Plato. And constellation names vary. So you see the crab is represented here by the scarab beetle and the figure of the lion in the scale, which is not Leo, is the constellation Centaurus. So there is the ancient Egyptian sky, okay? You've got things that were familiar to them, hippopotamus, crocodile, giant boat, Kanawi fish, prowl, that's right down there, the teapot, but they're not using it right there. That's Scorpius, that's the prow. Here's the winter sky. There's what we would call Orion, but you see they've expanded it. And the three stars that are a belt of Orion have become the three jewels in the Egyptian crown at this bigger star. There's the jaw, which is the Hyades, and there's the Pleiades, it's a fly. Now, the Babylonians, uh, preserved in an almost canonical state dating back to the 12th century. And the earliest fragment known is from the 7th century, but the celestial data suggests a much earlier origin of the observational base. So probably around 1350 to 1150 before Common Era. So they have two large clay tablets called Mulepin with six and five lists of different contents. The first tablet, has a star catalog. It has three lists of heliacal risings and settings. It's got what's called Zitsu, which is culminating asterisms, and a list of constellations in the lunar path, gods who stand in the path of the moon through whose region the moon during a month passes repeatedly and keeps touching them. This is the predecessor of our modern zodiac. The second tablet has rules for the calendar, has rules for the sundial, and rules for Omina, which is relations between gods and celestial bodies. Now, later, you have the Seleucid Babylonians. This is the era of the successors of Alexander the Great who conquered Babylon in 331 BCE. And by this time, Mulepin was about a thousand years old and was considered old fashioned, but not out of date. But there is the Babylonian winter sky. You see, there's Orion, which is the shepherd of Anu, and there, is the bull of heaven. It's already starting to turn into Taurus. There is the seven gods, which is the Pleiades cluster. There, you notice that's ge what we would now call Gemini, but you see it's two sets of twins, the great twins and the little twins. Here's the winter sky. There's the twins in, in, in the later Seleucid period. 
the two twins have become one set of twins, okay? It's starting to look like Gemini now. There's the ancient Babylonian summer sky, and you can see there is what we would call the teapot, but it's the god Pavelsang. There's the scorpion, Aries becoming Scorpius. Here's the later Seleucid version. You see what they've added is the maiden over there, but otherwise it looks more or less the same. So now let's meet Hipparchus of Nicaea, who's a Greek astronomer, geographer, and mathematician. He was the founder of trigonometry and discovered the procession equinoxes. He made use of the observations and perhaps the mathematical techniques accumulated over centuries by the Babylonians and several other Greek uh, scientists and may have been the first to develop a reliable method to predict solar eclipses. And he was the one that compiled the first comprehensive star catalog of the Western world. Then we have Ptolemy. He was a Greek astronomer from 100 to 178 Common Era in Alexandria, Egypt. Collected descriptions of 1,022 stars in a book called The Great System of Astronomy. He was the one that created those 48 constellations that she was right at the beginning, based on Greek or Roman mythology with estimates of the brightness based largely on the observations of Hipparchus, who you just met. And his book was translated twice into Arabic in the ninth century and popularized under its shortened Arabic title, The Almagest, which means the largest book. And then everything went crazy in Europe, all kinds of successive invasions and everything kind of collapsed and a lot of knowledge was lost. But fortunately, there were Arab scientists who were the principal astronomers between the 8th and the 11th century. And many of the Arabic language star descriptions in the Almagest, which I just told you about, came to be used widely today as names for stars. This guy, Abu al Hussein al Araman al Sufi, we'll just call him al Sufi, produced and revised an updated version of Ptolemy's Almagest, the Kiwar Surah al Kawaki, which means the Book of Fixed Stars. That was around 964 CE. And they had a listing of the Arabs' own star names, magnitudes determined by Al Sufi himself, two drawings of each constellation, one as it's seen in the sky, and one that reversed as if you went out into the sky and you were looking back at the Earth. And there's an example there. It's kind of a clever way of looking at things. Now let's quickly look at Arab star names because most are related to the constellation. For example, the star Deneb means tail, and it labels that part of Sigma 6-1. Some describe the star as Sirius, which literally translates as scorching. This is the brightest star in the sky. Many have the Arabic prefix al, like al-gul, the gul, because it means the. Other time, over time, translators sometimes omitted this prefix arbitrarily. Hence, several star names of Arabic origin are given elsewhere with or without that prefix. Some were corrupted when Arabic texts were translated to the Latin beginning from the 12th century, sometimes extremely. This often changed the meaning or left the name meaningless. Other names were mistakenly transferred from one star to another, so the name might even refer to a different constellation, Greek or Arabic, rather than to the one of the star's actual residence. An example is Betelgeuse, which is that a variable star in the constellation Orion. We have no idea how it's pronounced, we don't know precisely what it means because it was corrected. Local Arab tribes have their own names for bright stars like Aldebaran, and they commonly regarded single stars as representing animals or people. For example, Alpha and Beta Ophiuchi were regarded as a shepherd and his dog, while neighboring stars made up the outlines of the field of sheep. Some Arabic names were already so many centuries old, the meanings were lost even to Al Sufi and his contemporaries, and they remain unknown today. And other star names used by Al Sufi and his compatriots were direct translations of Ptolemy's descriptions, like Fomaho, which comes from the Arabic meaning mouth of the southern fish, which is where Ptolemy had described it in the Almagest. So there is the Big Dipper. You see all of those stars that make up the Dipper, they all have their Arabic names there. So there's what the sky looks like in the Almagest. And as you can see, it's very, very similar to Ptolemy's sky. It's influenced. There's a teapot, part of the archer. There's the scorpion. Here's the winter sky. There's Orion. Let's just sort of put some pictures in there. You can see what that means. I mean, they've got their own take on this, but it's basically the same stuff. But they also had moon stations. 
28 positions defining a daily location of the moon. The time of the station begins when the stars start to rise before the sun, 13 to 14 days per station. One of the stations has 14 days. We've got 365 days in a year. Each station is recognized by a star or a group of stars. This system served as an agricultural, meteorological, and health calendar. So there's the moon station. And you see here, the teapots become the ostriches. Okay, there's the scorpion sting. There's the winter station. There's Orion. You can see that shoulder side of Al Jauza. That's Betelgeuse that we were talking about a moment ago. You see, there is the Hyades and the Pleiades. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that the only thing happening in Europe was Plato and the Greeks, because the Macedonians had a sky too. Astro-ethnological research among Macedonian people only began in 1982, and it was organized by the Planetarium at the Youth Cultural Center. And the past years, about 140 villages in the Republic of Macedonia were visited, and over 1,500 inhabitants interviewed and surveyed. And these constellations you're about to see are not influenced by Ptolemy at all. Look, there's the big difference. A group of Thebes. There's up here you've got a trivet and tongs and an auger, which is what we call Cygnus the Swan and, and uh, the lyre of the harp. Okay. There is the winter sky. There is Orion. You see it's three different things. It's plowman, it's oxen, it's, it's a set of scales. There's the Hyades, it's the fox and pig. There's the mother hen, which is the Pleiades. The Romanians also had a different sky. They have three essential components, pre-Christian, ancestral, pastoral, agricultural stuff, Christian, and Romanian history. And Orion has four traditional Romanian constellations that are overlapping. So in a moment, I'm going to show you that. You can see they're overlapping there. It's impossible to make them out. Hang on, I'm going to zoom in for a sec. But look at all these things. You've got horses and chariots and sides, and God's chair and a mastiff and a whale and carps. There is Orion. That's a little closer. You see, there's three things. There's an auger, there's a plow, there's a sickle, depending on which part of the country you're in. All kinds of interesting stuff. There's the summer sky. Again, you can see all kinds of interesting things that you don't see. In Ptolemy's sky, but there's the scorpion down there. There's the archer still there. There's the scorpion. That's the same. Sardinia also had a sky. You've got a fence for sheep, deer horn. The big dipper is the seven brothers. You can see Orion up here is the three Marias or the six. The hut, that's the Hyades. The bunch, that's the Pleiades. That summer sky, there's the brightest star there. Vega, but there's the of the cross story, the cross of St. Constantine is, is Cygnus. There's a bunch of different stuff. Let's look at Vedic culture, okay, in India. They have something called Rashi. They have all of the stuff that Ptolemy and the Arabs had. I'm not going to go over that again because it looks, as you can see here, very similar. But they had something called Rashi. And this is a sidereal zodiac of 360 degrees, like the tropical zodiac, divided into 12 equal parts. Each 12 part of 30 degrees is assigned a Rashi. They use two systems for measuring time, lunar and solar. And in both cases, one year is divided into 12 months, or Masha. And the name of the solar months originated from the constellation's name. So there it is, both the lunar and the solar and the seasonal stuff. This can get really confusing, okay? They have something called nakshatra, which is the ecliptic, the path of the sun, divided into 27 parts, connected with 27 asterisms known as the nakshatras. Some early versions had 28. They were used for timing rituals and determining birth lunar mansions. The names of the lunar months originated from those 12 visions names in which a full moon or pranima occurs. So on, like a solar day, which is sunrise to sunrise, a lunar day or a moon's position in a nakshatra does not depend on sun rising or moon rising. So a lunar day may start at any time in the solar day. This is why it can be confusing. Vedic people mostly use lunar months, adding another month every 32.5 months on average, four months every 11 years, to correct the mismatch between the lunar and the solar year. So there is a nakshatra going across the sky 
There is the teapot. Here's the winter sky. Here's Orion. You can see the top part of it they're using, the deer's head. And there's the Hyades, and there's the Pleiades. Okay, let's go all the way over the other side of the world here. And let's talk about Hawaiian starlines and wayfinding. Okay, so knowledge was passed down orally for many generations. And it was suppressed by white colonial rulers, and it was eventually lost. And then the Polynesian Voyage Society, or the PBS, which was founded in 1973, created Hokulea in 1975. And Hokulea is a traditional Hawaiian voyaging canoe with a mission to revive the art of wayfinding. And they found Nainoa Thompson, uh, the present, present, uh, current president of the PBS, asked Mal Pilio, who is a native of Sadawal. Micronesia was a master navigator and wayfinder to teach his knowledge of navigation to him with the intention of reviving the knowledge that was once lost to the Hawaiians. And with the knowledge learned from now, they were able to recover their star lines. So the way this works is each star line is a group of main stars. Stars connect, making constellations. Navigators remember the, the rising and setting house of these stars, the stars that connect each line and the lines that point directly to north and south. The star line's positions in the night sky slowly change over time, each star line being more prevalent at night according to the season. So here are the various star lines, okay? There's the four, we're gonna go through them one at a time. Okay, so the first one is Keika o Makali'i, or the baler of Makali'i. And it's shaped as a canoe baler with scoops Orion, and the Pleiades up into the night sky. So you can see Orion there just outside of the, the Baylor. The main stars from north to south are Hokule, which is Capella, Nanamua, which is Castor, Nanahopi, which is Pollux, Poana, which is Procyon, and A'a, which is Sirius. Mentaka is an important star in this line because it rises and sets directly east or west, giving the navigator an easy pointer star for direction. That's the top right there. Now, Mirzim, which is next to Aa, Sirius, and Canopus, connect together to create a southern pointer. And I'm using the Arab names here because it's hard to pronounce some of these Hawaiian names. Uh, Mahasim and Mengalinin connect to create a northern pointer. Now, why would you need two pointers? Wouldn't one be enough? No, because the constellation will rise and it will set, and which means at those times, you will only see part of the constellation. So having a pointer at each end solves that problem. You will always have a pointer to point north, south. The next one is Ka'awiki Ka'amo'o, which is the bone back lizard. It's depicted as the backbone of a lizard or mo'o. It also represents a genealogical backbone, each star representing a generation. So the star line starts with the North Star, See up in the top there, and connects down to the seven, which is the Big Dipper. Uh, Arcturus and Spica are two lines in the middle of the star line. Okay, and Hokulea, the star of gladness, is a zenith star. Like you can see with the arrow there um, of Hawaii, meaning it will be directly overhead when you are at the latitude of the Hawaiian Islands. It's a very important star to navigators. The next two um, Ikealania is Me'e, which is the combination of four stars that create a box. You see, it says the voice of joy there. And that connects down to the Southern Cross, and that's the Southern Pointer. So there's your two pointers. Then there's Manaya Kalani, which is the, it refers to the legend of the demigod Maui and his magical fish that is used to pull islands up from the sea. And this star line consists of the Navigator's Triangle on the north and the Maui's fish hook on the south. The Navigator's Triangle is three stars, Deneb, Vega, and Altair. And yes, that's the one that we Northern astronomers call the Summer Triangle. Okay, it's the Polynesian Triangle too. It represents Hawaii, Rapa Nui, and Arotoa. And these three islands were pulled from the sea by Maui with his fish hook, and that's Scorpius down there. The Northern Pointer is found in the Navigator's Triangle when you connect Deneb, and solder. And 
So those are the stars in the triangle. There's the northern pointer, and there is the other pointer, which is when you connect the Sheba and Noor down at the bottom there. The last one is Calopi o Coelho, which is the kite of Coelho. And Coelho is a great chief of Kauai and Oahu. And this star line represents the kite that she was lost as a child. So the three star lines start with the frigate bird, and that's what we would call Cassiopeia today. The center of the star line is the kite of Coelho with a great square of Pegasus. The four stars that make the kite are named after Coelho's greatest ancestor. And all four were famous chiefs of their time. The star line then connects south to two stars, which is Deneb, Kaidos, and Fomalhaut. So the northern pointer, there it is there, between the frigate bird and the kite, there's the other pointer right there. So that, I mean, it's just a quick crash course in how they do this. This is the summer sky for the Hawaiians. You can see there's the deep black, but they don't use that, but there is Scorpius. That's Maui's fish up. There's the baler in the winter sky. There's Orion. There is the Hyades, the Pleiades have become the chief sign. Now, the Tongans also have a sky full of navigational lore. The star may have multiple names in their system, but the star is part of numerous star paths. And <coughs> depending on which Tongan island group it originates from, they did not have a name for Polaris. And the constellation Scorpio, parts in or stars of, are also absent from the Tongan star lore, which is weird. But just about every culture you're going to see has got Scorpius in there somewhere, but they don't. It's surprising. Anyway, um, the common ancestry of Polynesian star lore is evident in similarities of the labeling of stars. So the Pleiades is called Mataliki in Tongan. Matariki in Maori and Makali'i in Hawaiian. So there's the Tongan sky. And you can see that you've got uh, a string of fish, which is the belt and sword of Orion. You've got the belt of Orion is a wild duck. You've got a pigeon perch, which is the head of Taurus. Rigel, you see there, and Betelgeuse, like that. Here's the winter sky. You can see they, the, um, there isn't a whole lot happening there, but they they got their own take on it. Now in Vanuatu, you've got Orion's belt is a long yoke. Orion's sword is a short yoke. The traditional fan made from palm leaves is the Khalil is Orion's body. You're gonna see this in a moment. They have something called Ku, which is a pinch used for taking hot stones out of the fire. That's Taurus and the Hyades. You've got the Pleiades are either young boys or girls. Scorpion's dart uh, is Kaharu, which is a rat, seen in the evening in the zenith when it's time to prepare gardens. They've got an earth oven. That's, that's the large and small Magellanic clouds. And you've got all kinds of different ways of viewing the Southern Cross. So here you go. There is Orion. So it's a short yoke, a long yoke. There's the tweezers for hut. Stones, which is the Hyades. There's the young boys or girls, which is the Pleiades. There's the winter sky. You see, there's the earth oven, or there's the, a rat. <laughs> we got a rat there. And you see the earth ovens down below there, the uh, Magellanic clouds. Okay, let's go to South America. Let's talk Aztec. They use the night sky as the star movements for the calendars and the measurement of both agricultural. And sacred cycles. A great part of this knowledge, unfortunately, is lost as a consequence of the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. Indigenous people and some Spanish priests preserved colonial codices, which incorporated descriptive text in Spanish and Nahuatl. So we know some of their constellations. We know that Orion's belt was two wood sticks used to light the new fire in commemoration, celebrated every 52 years, called the Binding of the Years which coincided with the beginning of the new year. We know that the Pleiades for them was a marketplace. And we know that Gemini was the ball game of the stars. So there is the Aztec summer sky. You see, there's the Scorpius down there. There's the teapot, they don't use it. And there is 
the winter sky. I'm going to zoom in on this. There's the ball game of the stars. You see there is Orion, and you see the belt and the sword become the two sticks that we were just talking about. So the Mayans, their codices were thought to have been taken to Europe by the first explorers of the New World as evidence of their discoveries. The Paris Codex in particular was long forgotten until a priest found it in 1859 in a chimney corner in the National Library of Paris and where it had suffered considerable damage. But despite this, it does describe some asterisms seen by the Mayas. And some of them are probably related to a group of constellations while others are not. So we've lost, like the Aztecs, we've lost some stuff, but we do know some of the stuff. There's the summer sky, okay? There is the um, area around the teapot and the scorpion, you see it's become a snake there. And there's the winter sky. You can see that there is Orion, which is the primordial fire and a turtle. And the Hyades have become an owl. We have the Tupi Guarani in Brazil. We know from the book, Histoire de la Mission de Père Capucine en Ile de Maragon et Père Cirque Voisin, published in Paris in 1614, that the Tupi people identified some 30 constellations, but unfortunately, they only described seven of them in the book. Principal ones one is the winter sky being dominated by the white hostage. In the first two weeks of June, this constellation is fully visible in the eastern sky in the evening, including and indicating the beginning of winter in the south of Brazil and the start of the dry season in the north. And the summer sky is dominated by the old man, which depicts an old man holding a stick. In the second half of December, the constellation is fully visible in the eastern sky, and it marks the beginning of summer in the southern parts of Brazil and the start of the rainy season in the north. So here you see. There is what we call a riot. You see, it's become the two lower legs of the old man who is holding a stick, and that the Hyades has become his head, and that the Pleiades has become a feather in his cap. And there's the winter stuff. Okay. And there's the teapot. And you see that uh, the white ostrich is part of what we would now call Scorpio, right there. The Tucano have an interesting sky too. They have the snake, which is part of Scorpio, Sagittarius, and Corona Australis. And it's setting where the sunset corresponds to the beginning of the year for this group. They have an as handle, which is part of Orion plus Beetlejuice and Bellatrix. You've got a kind of uh, device to cook fish, which is the Hyades cluster. And you've got the Pleiades which is a very significant timekeeper as it is in many other cultures for planting and rainy season. So there's a snake. You can see they've got shrimp, they've got a kind of fish, they've got a tortoise over there. Here is Orion, it's become an as handle. And there is the Pleiades, it's a kind of a grill to cook fish. And there is a group of stars, which is the Pleiades. So let's go to Australia. And the Buran people. 140 years ago, a Buran family at Lake Cairo, which is in northwestern Victoria, Australia, told William Stanbridge their stories relating to the night sky. And 40 stars, constellations, and other celestial phenomena were named and located. He wrote them down and gave them to the philosophical institute in Melbourne. And in his paper, he wrote down the Aboriginal term and gave it its European equivalent. And he wrote that they pride themselves upon knowing more of astronomy than any other tribe. So let's look at what their sky looks like. There you go. Now you see, this is a snapshot of their world. There's meat ants, there's needlewood, there's fowls and crowned parakeets and types of ants and parrots and stuff. There's the teapot, they don't use it. There's what we call Scorpius now, it's that red rump parrot. There is the summer sky. You see Orion has become the female eagle wife of Laraville and two teenage boys. And the Hyades has become a pink cockatoo and the Pleiades is a group of girls. And then there's various other animals that put the in The uh, or Australian 
Aboriginal cultural groups are located in the northern part of New South Wales, and they've survived European invasion and lost much of their country, and their culture and connection to country remains strong, including an extensive cultural astronomy first recorded in the 1860s. So there's the Camilla Royce guy. You see they've got all kinds of people from their culture, famous people like old uh, Waringen there, and animals. And there's the summer sky. You see, there's Orion. <laughs> it's a group of people. And there's old Philar and old Gunya, which is the Hyades. And there is a group of people there, which is the Pleiades. Now, I wish I had more to show you on the Yongu because they're amazing people. But you see, I've got Orion here. You see, it's become a boat. And the three stars are the seat in the middle of a boat. And the sword is actually a string with a fish. Okay, let's go Asian. Let's look at Chinese Xinguan. These are asterisms, not constellations. They have varied through different eras in Chinese history. They, the Xinguan thing, the southern celestial pole created following the introduction of Western constellations in China by missionaries. And the most common one that they have has got 300. And they've now been edged out by Western constellations. Look at that. Try and memorize that sky. There is the sea flag. There is the brightest star. Look at all of these. There's the winter sky. There's Orion. There's the Hyades. There's the Pleiades. All kinds of stuff going on. Now, the Japanese had a similar sky, but they have a very some very complex things tied into it. They have something called Say Shuku, they have seven celestial palaces or lunar lodges, it's each associated to a talismanic animal. The Say Shuku were this used to determine the position of sun and planets as well as the moon. And the talismanic animals with their associated Say Shuku probably related to the direction of the handle of the Big Dipper, which they call the North Seven Stars, as, as they do in China and Korea and Japan, pointing at the equinoxes and solstices. So, before the common era, when the Saishiku were created, the Big Dipper not, did not appear to set to them because it was a it was relatively higher in the sky. Most astronomical observation in Japan until the Meiji Restoration was closely related to astrology. Divination was a big thing for them. So they had moon stations. Here you see some of them. There's Orion, become the turtle snout, the investigator. There is the net, which is the Hyades. There is the Pleiades, which is a stopping place. There's the summer. Station there is the tea pot become a dipper in a basket. Remember this map from the very beginning? This is this Korean map, which their constellations first appear in the records of the Grand Historian in the Han Dynasty, describing the Xia Dynasty in about 2000 BCE. 272 constellations were based on the Korean constellation map, which you see here, which is carved on stone in 1395, but it has its origin from another sky map about 2,000 years earlier, which, like I said earlier, doesn't match our modern sky anymore. 1,467 stars and about 190 constellations whose shape, whose shape is slightly different than the Chinese one. And it's, like I said, it's so old that only about 300 stars match today. So there, looks very much like the Chinese sky. There is Orion, there. The Hyades there is the Pleiades. There is the Sea Pot. Okay, let's go north. Let's go to the Inuit sky. And I chose this picture deliberately because you can see right over the top of the, the, the igloo there, you can see the Hyades and the Pleiades. So the top part of Orion to the Inuit is two placed far apart. And the belt is the runners chasing. And the spirit of a polar deer, that's the Hyades above the igloo there. And the breastbone, or some Arctic First Nations call this the baying dogs, is the Pleiades. Sirius is the flickering. So there's the Hyades, there's the Pleiades, there's your constellation. Okay. So you can see here, there's the two placed far apart and the runners. <coughs> that's Orion. There's the spirit of a polar bear, it's the Hyades. There's the breastbone, that's the Pleiades. They don't have the summer sky, so I can't give you any information about that. The Norse people, 
despite a very rich oral and written tradition, there has been very little preserved of North star names and constellations. Two major problems, the use of Latin or Greek or Roman names during medieval period and the romanticism in the 19th century when new names and traditions arose. Even today, the New Age movement is inventing new names and traditions. Our main source of North mythology comes from the poetic Edda and the prosaic Snorri Sturluson's Edda, but there exist other sources with surprisingly few references to this guy, considering these guys were master navigators. We know they were. And this indicates a fair knowledge of astronomy for navigation. So the Norse people used local landmarks in combination with observations to tell the time. They were aware of the difference between sun time and star time. The existence of the Norse calendar is mentioned as part of a calendar reform in the Icelandic Chronicle. And this calendar was used from the 8th to the 12th century when it was replaced with a Julian. So Orion's belt is the fisherman. It's also known as Great Fish Stock. And these names seem to be used locally. Fishermen are used in Norway and Iceland, while Frigg's distaff is used in Sweden. And the mouth of the wolf was the Hyades. In Norse mythology, there are two wolves having the sun and the moon, and the mouth of the wolf is supposed to be ecliptic, and it can be interpreted as one of these wolves. So there you have a woman's cart and a man's cart, which is a big dipper and a little dipper. There is the fisherman, the Orion, there's the wolf mouth. The Sami people have a very interesting sky. They got Sarva, the elk, which is the main constellation, which consists of Cassiopeia, Perseus, and Ariga. They've got Favna, which is the hunter. They've got the Big Dipper. They've got the sky support, the Boenja, which is Polaris. You've got Gala, which is Poseidon, and his sons, Galabarnik, which is Orion's belt. The ski runners and Favna's helpers, the runner. They've got the dog pack, which is a Pleiades. In some areas, it's called the calf pack. And the bird path of the year mark is the Milky Way. So there, you see, is Gala's sons. That's Orion. There is the pack of dogs, which is the Pleiades. There is the Big Dipper, which is Favna, with his bow and arrow. And the story goes, he is trying to shoot Star of the Elk over there. Whoops, hang on. But he has to be very careful because if he hits Polaris, which is the sky support, the whole sky will fall down. Gotta be careful. Now, let's talk about First Nations. Let's talk about the Ojibwe constellation. They have uh, Bib and Kanini, who is the winter maker. I love this. It's a great constellation. We'll see. Mishibuza, which is Curly Tail, a great panther, a big spirit cat that lives at the bottom of lakes and caused flooding or water danger. When the great cat was overhead, the lakes would not be frozen and would be dangerous to cross. You got Oji, the fisher, able to trick the ogres and free the birds, saving everyone with his courage and wit. Fisher is not diurnal or nocturnal, but prefers to always be on the move, sleeping and eating night and day. He does not build a home in one place and return as most animals do. It rather makes its home in different places. And then you got Maha, which is the loon. Very important messenger and clan leader. The loon stands at the doorway between the water and the land or the material and the spirit form. So there is the winter sky. And you see there's the moose, there's the crane. You see the loon there, Maang, Oji, the fisher. There's Orion, which has become the winter maker. They made it a much larger constellation. And you see that. The Pleiades has become the hole in the sky. There's the summer sky. Okay, now Lakota and Dakota, I put this image in here for a reason. You've got the Spirits Road, which is the Milky Way. You've got the Hand, okay, which is Orion's belt and sword and the stars of Rigel and Eridanus Beta. You're going to see this in a moment. You've got the racetrack, which is divide, subdivided into the sacred hoop. And the animal's backbone, you've got the Pleiades is the seven little girls, and you've got the snake, like this. Okay, so now there you can see Orion, how it is a hand facing downward. And there is the Hyades, which is the buffalo embryo, and there's the seven girls. That's what it would look like if you put a picture up there, like that. There's the summer sky with the Thunderbird. And the blue birth woman being the Big Dipper and the Salamander. Now the Navajo have 
a name for the Pleiades is Gilyehi. It's a constellation of timekeeping and planting for the Navajo people. What I was saying, don't let Gilyehi see you plant your seed. This comment refers to the Pleiades disappearing in early May and reappearing in late June or early July. Other Navajo stories of Gilyehi tell you that seven mischievous young boys follow ones who plant too late and snap seeds out of the ground. You have Atse Itsosi, the first swim one. That's Orion to us. He's a young warrior carrying a bow and arrow. Like Gilgehi, this constellation is related to planting and is seen every season except the part of the summer. Atse Itsosi is often spoken of as son in law to Atse Itso, which includes part of the constellation Scorpio. In accordance with the Navajo tradition of mother in laws and son in laws not speaking or meeting, Atse Itsosi and Atse Itso are never seen in the sky at the same time. So there's the Navajo winter sky. And you see around the North Star, you have the Big Dipper has become the revolving male, and the Little Dipper has become the revolving female who are revolving around the hearth. And there is Orion, the first slim one, right up there. And there's Bill Yankee. Revolving male and the revolving female. There's the Summer sky. Now, a few years ago, our Halifax Center got together with the Mi'kmaq. And the Mi'kmaq had a problem. They have a, a lunar calendar and they no longer knew how to use it because of the bloody residential schools trying to stamp out culture. It's disgraceful anyway. So, what they did is they sat down with the elders, our, our astronomers, and they said, Tell us your story. So they did. They told us stories of how things work, and they saw that there was a recurring theme of the great white moon in the winter. <clears throat> you see here, you've got all different pieces, but the top there, you've got chief moon time. That was the piece that, that was missing, and they realized what they're talking about is supermoon. So if, if every time there was a supermoon, what would happen if we stuck chief moon time in there? Well, it, that's what put everything back to the sink. And we were able to help them discover how to use this thing again. So we now do regular presentations at national parks and star parties and so on with the Mi'kmaq people talking about their sky. The society also, if you're interested, has books on the First Nations views of the sky and this planisphere, which at the moment has three different uh, First Nations views of the sky. And we're, we're furiously working on adding some more there. So in a few years, we hope to have a whole bunch more. But if you're interested, go to our website, resc.ca, you'll find it. Now, does everybody know who this is? That's Hagrid. And his dragon. Why on earth am I showing you that? Well, it is an interesting thing that there's an awful lot of things in the sky that were named many years ago, but then have gone through different names. NGC 2301 was originally known. <laughs> as Copeland's Golden Worm, dates back to about 1830, but then it became known as the Seabird Cluster, and honestly, I, I never thought that looked like a seabird, but then eventually we got young astronomers who were fans of J.K. Rowling, and I looked at the sky and went, it's Hagrid's Dragon, and there it is. I think that's the best name ever, really, you know? I mean, I looked at the dragon, don't you think? Is it discovered originally by William Herschel in 1786, is visible through seven by 50 binoculars, that's where you find it. You find Betelgeuse there and the star right at the top of the lane. You go right down into that, that pincher in Monoceros. It's right there. It's easy to find. This is the Golden Snitch, of course. And NGC 7380 has recently been renamed the Wizard one. It was originally the Wizard Nebula, but now it's Harry Potter and the Golden Snitch. Now, this was discovered by William Virgil's sister, Carolyn. This is a little more difficult to observe. You're probably going to need an optical tree filter to do it. It's about 7,200 light years away. It's an active star forming region. It's right there. If you use Cassiopeia and Lacerda, you can kind of draw a line right in there along the Milky Way there. That's where you're going to find it. Now, perspective. Two thirds of the world's population can't see much of the sky anymore because of the misuse of artificial light at night. Okay? They can see a handful of first magnitude stars. But bright objects and you don't probably even realize the planets. What they see is glass and steel and concrete. 
And it's an entirely different perspective than our ancient ancestors had when they looked up and out to the edge of the observable universe, okay? <clears throat> Over the years, we came up with all kinds of established views of this is what we're looking at in the sky. And each one of the four people you see before you here was given a view of the sky, which well, this is how the sky works. And each one of these four people looked up and went, yeah, no, I see something different. That, no, it doesn't work for me. And you know what? They came up with a new view, which was correct, which gave us a whole new view of the world. And I don't want to give you the impression that just old white guys do this. Lots of famous female astronomers have done the same thing. Annie Jump Cannon there on the left, she figured out colored stars and, and came up with what eventually turned into Hertzsprung Russell diagram. And I mean, we can go on, but all kinds of people have looked up and seen patterns other than the ones that people originally put there. So you know what? I think it's a wrap, I really do. You know, don't you think? But I don't want you to go out there and necessarily look at, well, I mean, I want you to see different patterns in the sky that other cultures put up there. That's why I'm giving you all this. What I really want you to do is go out there and look at the sky and see your own patterns. Make up your own. Because that's what this is all about, right? So thank you for your time and your uh, attention. And I would be happy to answer any questions. If you want. I'll come back. That was fantastic. Um, thank you, Charles. You uh, an hour. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> did. Yeah, even, an hour. even with a long introduction, you still made it. Oh, yeah. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Okay. Uh, one from Galen. Uh, this is fascinating. Thanks, Charles. One question. In the many centuries of Polynesian navigation, they must have noticed the precession of the equinoxes which changes the position of the north respect to the stars. Have you found any evidence that they took this into account? Um, I, I do not consider my expert in this, and I would suggest very strongly you go online and you go to the Hawaiian uh, Wayfinding Society that I just told you about, because they describe this in detail. Yeah, they did get this. And, and you can get far more detailed descriptions of how this works from them. And I would encourage you to do it. It's a great site. Uh, and I actually, some of my, my uh, astronomers up here have got sailing boats and they've tried some of this stuff. You know, it's, it's fun stuff. But they were navigating with stars and uh, water current temperatures and prevailing winds and, and it were extremely successful with it, as you can see. But yeah, the, the, the basic system means you have key constellations which have pointers at both ends, and you know at this time of night, this is the way it's oriented. So it's, a, it's an amazing system. Okay. Um, also, uh, Steve Becker mentions that he had heard that the Inca have dark constellations in the dark lanes of the Milky Way. So instead of just constellations oh. based on the bright stars, mm -hmm. they also had constellations based the on the, the blackness where there aren't stars. Yeah, you know, there's all kinds of constellations that are, and, and views of the sky in different cultures I didn't even get to, because I mean, there's, there's lots of them. If you're really interested in these, um, go to Stellarium, which is a free download. Uh, to your computer. It's a planetary program, which is great for, for planning star viewing. But one of the things you can do is you can tell it to show you all of the different cultures I just showed you. You, you can view the sky for yourself when you go. That's how I generated this slide. But yes, there's all kinds of interesting quirks like that. I, I, I was kind of trying to focus on those particular constellations, which is why I didn't go to Inca. But yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about a different perspective entirely. Right. Okay. Um, let me uh, ask one other question from Susan. Could petroglyphs have been early star maps? Well, I mean, right at the very beginning of the presentation, you saw the, the Arminci cave, which shows you what archaeologists believe is a piece of the Milky Way. And I'm reasonably certain that they're not the only people that drew the sky in their cave, although some of them we may not recognize. 
that way. Um, very hard to do, you know, but, but um, there are some, uh, this, this is probably more common if you're looking at some of the um, First Nations people in Australia, like uh, the young women and so on, well, they have uh, petroglyphs and so on that refer to their spirits that are present in the world now and see them in the sky as well. So yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, let me ask if there are any other questions. Those are the ones that I have uh, that have been put into the chat so far. If anyone else has questions, go ahead and type those in. Um, while we're waiting, let me just mention that, um, again, thanks to Charles for this great presentation, uh, that it was certainly a quick re uh, view of uh, an incredible number of uh, world uh, cultures. Uh, with respect to astronomy. So that was fascinating. Um, again, uh, check out peaknature.org for uh, information about upcoming activities, both astronomy talks on Fridays and other uh, activities going on as well. Um, so Karen has asked uh, another question. What is the best source for more information on these topics? And Karen, unless you clarify, I'm going to assume you mean the um, the, uh, the various sky cultures that Charles talked about. Charles, you have thoughts on the best um, source? Well, again, if you, if you go to Stellarium, it doesn't just give you the option of, of making the your sky view one of those ancient cultures like Egyptian or Aztec or whatever. What it comes with is a um, narrative which describes the sky you're looking at and gives you some history and gives you references to various different uh, places where you can look up more information because this is a lot of different cultures with a lot of different sources you know so uh but yeah if you want to go to you know the the tongan side it, it'll it'll go through all of that stuff for you some are, are have more information than others and, and over the years they have been adding stuff uh consistently um the first nation stuff <clears throat> is uh, we've got some references that I say that, that are available from the REC uh, bookstore there. Um, we're, we're constantly working on this stuff. Unfortunately, things, institutions like the residential school work very hard to try and stamp this stuff out. And we're trying to rebuild trust with our First Nations and, and recover these things. Um, I've been talking to the elders in Seashell First Nation where I am, and I know that, for example, the Big Dipper is the seven brothers. Each brother represents one of the seven clans in their nation. So, I mean, there's all kinds of, and I know they were great navigators too, but unfortunately quite a bit of their stuff has been lost and we're, we're working hard to see if we can find some elders that can still give us pieces of it. But as we put it together, we're going to be putting that out there for people because I think this is really, really um, important. I mean, if, if any of you ever make your way up to the Sunshine Coast in BC and, and Seashell, please come to the observatory. I will personally show you these things in the sky. We have to do that. and. Uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's great, Charles. Um, so is there a, uh, and you may have had it earlier and I may have missed it. Uh, do you have a website that uh, gives some information about the, the organization the, there? The uh, website for the national organization, resc.ca, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada.ca. And, um, for my own center, it's coastastronomy.ca. Coast astronomy. All one word dot ca for Canada. Okay, I put those in the chat for people who are interested in that. I also mentioned Stellarium software in the chat. Um, oh, except that I only sent it to Galen. Galen, can you type that? Oh no, you can't. Never mind. I'll put it in the chat uh, in, in, in shortly. Um, that uh, also uh, Marilyn Doolin mentioned that the secrets of the Pueblo universe, star lore of the American Southwest by Mark Thomas Rainey is another um, uh, resource for um, Pueblo type uh, information. The um, uh, Galen also points out that the planetarium software that we have in our planetarium for those of you who are viewing who are local um, and uh, once we open up our software, I mean, our, uh, our, our, our uh, peak planetarium again, 
um, that we have the software in our planetarium to show many, not all, but many of these uh, cultural views into the sky and uh, cultural constellations. So we may have an opportunity for future programs in person if you have a chance to visit um, the, exactly. the planetarium. Um, I am going to uh, copy some of these notes that I've been making and try to send them to everyone. And so before you go, check out the chat for some of these references. And also at the bottom of the chat, there are usually three dots down there. If you click on those, you might find that um, the um, there's an option to save the chat. And if you do that, you can save the chat uh, in on your particular computer, and that would give you access to some of these uh, references that we're putting into the chat. So if anyone has any other questions they think of, uh, I can be reached at info at coastastronomy.ca. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Charles, and very thanks welcome. to the opportunity. Thanks to everyone who has been uh, participating in this, and we hope to see you again for our future astronomy talks.